For those of you who don't know, we are very technically proficient over here, and we have both in-person service and online live service. So, hello, you guys, if you're watching live, um, I was going to say Change Point Kotzebue, but you might be outside of Kotzebue if you're in Marshall. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you guys today, and yeah. So we're just going to jump into it today, and we're in the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Last week, Lance talked about Luke chapter 1. We're going through the life and ministry of Jesus. And it was really funny because Lance and I had a little brainstorming session the other day, um, a week or two ago, and we're like, man, what? We just got out of our series out of James, and our summer of doing is over, and we're like, what should we be preaching about in church? And so we talked about it for a while, and we both unanimously decided to do Romans is the way to go. We're going to preach about Romans. So he's like, I'll take Romans 1, you take Romans 2, and I was like, great. And then Sunday, uh, he posted his video in his Luke chapter 1, and I was like, oh, we changed it, I think. And so we were at our teaching team meeting, and uh, Lance wasn't in our teaching team meeting. I was like, well, and they're like, what are you guys talking about? And I said, well, we were going to do Romans. I was supposed to do Romans chapter 2 this week, but Lance talked about Luke 1, so I think I have to do Luke 2. And they're like, you know what you should do? And I said, what? And they said, you should do Romans 2. And I said, <laughs> yeah, okay, no, that's not going to happen. We're sticking with Luke. So we're doing the life and ministry of Jesus. Can, you, can everyone hear me okay? Is it ringing at all? Is everything good with the sound? Cool. So there's a lot to cover in Luke chapter 2. Now remember, we are kind of focusing on the life and ministry of Jesus. Now when you get to know Jesus, you'll find that these two words are pretty much synonyms. His life was his ministry. He lived, breathed, ate ministry. Actually, he ate a lot of fish. Um, he ate a lot of fish. But uh, other than actually eating, his life was ministry. And so today, I guess we are having Christmas in August because we are going to the birth of Jesus Christ. So go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 2 with me and let's read. And as we go, uh, like I said, there's a lot to cover, but there's really two portions of this that I want to uh, really kind of dive into a little more. Okay, So we'll hit those two also. So this is what it says. It says, in those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Now, to be registered, guys, this is pretty much a, a census. They're just having a census seeing where everybody is from, right, and how much the world is growing, I guess. So he said this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, and to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time for her to give birth came, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there is no place for them at the inn. So we all know, we've, we've all heard the story a thousand times. Jesus was prophesied to come. Mary was approached by an angel who said, hey, this Jesus guy is going to be born now, and he's going to be born from you, like, surprise. And Mary was like, okay, like, she was a trooper the entire way through. And then here is the moment where the rubber meets the road. She actually gives birth to baby Jesus, and he's laid inside of this manger because there wasn't room for him at the inn. Now, this is a really interesting part here that I want to talk about some, starting in verse 8. It said, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I feel... Like, that's a little bit of an understatement. Imagine if you, like angels... Like are weird, right? I don't think they really look so much like like humans. I have this angel tattoo on my arm of this like pretty lady pouring water out of a bowl. Um, but you know, if we if we just take a, uh, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit, guys. It's kinda... Okay, is that still good? Can you still hear me? All right. Okay. 
So if, if you uh, you don't have to turn there, but in uh, in Isaiah chapter six, this is the description that they give us of angels. It says here, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, these are angels, and each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. So these things, they had eyeballs, like a couple of them, they had wings, they were flying, I mean these things were interesting. And these were just shepherds. They, they weren't expecting anything. Like nothing happened that day that was going to like forewarn them that they were going to be approached by these angels. And yet all of a sudden they're down there chilling with their sheep and these angels just <laughs> pop up in front of them. Imagine these funky looking angels just right in front of you. And of course they would be filled with great fear because why... Are these angels chilling there now? And out of all, all, all people in the whole world, why to these like specific shepherds? And the angel said to them, fear not. And of course, that's the first thing that they say because they were filled with great fear. So the angel was like, look, guys, chill out. We're, I know, but let's talk. He says, so fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so my question is, they're probably wondering, okay, that's strange, but what does this have to do with me? And they say, and this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was... The angel, uh, there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. So recap. Shepherds are chilling there. They're with their sheep. They're doing what they've been doing for forever. And all of a sudden, these angels appear, and they're like, Hey, don't fear. There's a child that's born who's going to save the world. And apparently the angel wants them to go see this child because he says, uh, and this will be your sign that you find them, you're going to see this. And then not only are there two angels, but there's a whole host of heavenly people now worshiping and praising God. Can you imagine how intense this moment must have been for the shepherds? And as intense of a moment as this would be, my question is, I have it actually written here in my Bible, why? Why were these random shepherds the ones to be approached? Have you ever thought of that? There, there was millions of people in the world at the time. Jerusalem was a pretty big place. I mean, Israelites and he, I mean, they, they were a lot of people. And there were Sadducees. There were, there were religious people of more prominent standard, of more prominent standing in the community that probably had more going for them to actually be receptive of these angels, right? There were people who devoted their life to understanding scripture, to knowing about God, to being like following the Old Testament laws. Don't you think that they were the ones who should have been approached with this news first? But instead, God chose shepherds. And it's not like this is some rock star job where everybody is like, yeah, I want to be a shepherd someday, dude. Yeah, they get, oh, man, they have the life, you know. No, they slept out in the field. They were dirty. They didn't really have places to go. They probably made, I don't know what kind of income they made. But these were dirty shepherds, you know. And a lot of the times when you read, when you study up on this, a shepherd was a lot of the times people who actually didn't have very good standing in their communities, so they chose shepherding because they were able to wander with the sheep and just... So why on earth did God choose shepherds? Why did he choose shepherds? And I think the reason why says here in verse 10. Let's reread it a little bit closely. The angel appeared and the angel said to them, Fear not. 
For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Guys, when we look into the life and ministry of Jesus, as we continue to study through the book of Luke, you will see that Jesus didn't care about your standings. He didn't care about your social status. He doesn't care about your health. There is people that he touched who were plagued with diseases, who were sickly, who were outcasts, who were blind, who were lame, who were everything that you weren't supposed to be. And Jesus touched them. Jesus talked to them. He interacted with them. We're going to read about a time where Jesus was found eating dinner with tax collectors. And you've heard this before, but tax collectors were, they, they weren't fooling anybody. They knew they weren't liked. They knew that they were deceptive. They would go across and collect tax for the, for the city and then cash in some extra for themselves. These were, these were scoundrels. If you were born in the 1930s, you'd say they were rapscallions. They were not good people, and they knew it. And yet Jesus was there chilling in their house, eating with them. And he was actually confronted, like, why are you eating with these sinners? And I think it is so telling of who Jesus is and who God is that instead of approaching Pharisees, instead of approaching Sadducees, instead of pr pr approaching these high-ranking officials first, he chose the humble, the low-life shepherds. And the reason why this is important for us today is because... Have you ever asked yourself, why you? Guys, you, you, you know my testimony. You know my story. I was, you know, I had a lot of mental issues. I didn't think highly of myself. Um, There's a lot of bad things I wanted to do to myself. You know, we'll say it that way. And yet, like, God saved me. Like, God loved me. I didn't even love me. I didn't want to save myself. Why would God choose to save me? You know, why would he choose me? Have you ever asked yourself, why would God choose you? And the reason why is because the Bible says that God is not a respecter of age or persons. He doesn't care about your social status. He doesn't care about how you fit in with the world. He doesn't care about how much money you make. Or he doesn't care about these things about you. Jesus wants you. He wants you the way that you are. Now, don't get me wrong. God loves you enough to not allow you to stay in your sin. If you're living in sin, he will call you out of that. But right now, right now, at the first moment, Jesus wants you. He wants your heart, and everything else is going to come after. And so when he came to these shepherds, he was saying, look, I know who you are. I know the life that you've lived. I know why you're out here doing this. But look, something out there is bigger than yourself, and I want you to go find it. And that's what they did. It says, when the angels went away from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So the angels appeared and told them, look, like, this is what's going on. And the shepherds are like, let's go. Let's go. What, what do we have to stay here for? We have sheep. We have sheep. <laughs> let's go see this baby. And so they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the same that had been told to them concerning the child. So not only did they go find the child, but they essentially preached about the child. They shared with the with Mary and Joseph the things that were shared with them. And that's that's what we do on stage right now. I'm sharing with you guys the things that were shared with me here in the Bible. We preach the word, we preach Christ crucified, and that's what I'm sharing with you guys again today. So that's what they said. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And so what was the official response of the shepherds? Verse 20 tells us that the shepherds returned. They did what they were 
came to do. They saw Jesus. They got to share these words with Jesus. Mary took them in. She pondered them. And the shepherds went back to their sheep. And they were glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it has been told to them. If you guys were here last week, or if you listened online to what Prance, what Lance taught about, um, he shared how the first person to really glorify the coming King Jesus was actually a six-month-old fetus inside of Elizabeth. When Mary showed up with little tiny fetus Jesus, you don't hear that a lot, but you know, <laughs> when she showed up with little tiny fetus Jesus. And uh, should that be a shirt? No. Um, and Elizabeth was carrying John. John leapt in her womb. He knew that he was in the presence of Jesus. You guys remember that? How the baby was the first, a fetus, an unborn child was the first one to leap at, at, the, at the coming of Jesus. He felt him. The Holy Spirit filled up Elizabeth. And John leapt in her stomach. I can't imagine how that feels. Because Coco's pregnant, and we'll be watching a movie, and the next thing I know, she'll go, oh! And I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, baby just moved big time. And then she'll be like, oh! And then like, there it goes again. Sometimes she'll, she'll be sitting there, and the next thing you know, she's sprinting to the bathroom, you know? And so I can't imagine how a baby leaping in your womb feels like. But that's exactly what John did. And Elizabeth was probably like, I, uh, <laughs> uh, there's something special in there. And that's what happened. So he chose a fetus to glorify God um, before Jesus was born. And then after Jesus was born, he chose shepherds. And I want to share with you guys today that you might not feel worthy of being saved. You might have lived a life or gone through a season of sin where you've done stuff that you know you should have been doing or where you've neglected moving forward in Christ when you know that he was calling you forward. But guess what? That's the past. Jesus is calling you now. He loves you now. And he wants you to repent and move forward. These shepherds, they went back to their life. They went back to being shepherds, but they were glorifying and praising God. And I guarantee that this moment stuck with them for the rest of their lives. And I want to share that with you guys. Jesus loves you. He loves you. Your sin isn't too big. Your social status isn't too poor. Your family isn't too bad. You aren't too dumb. You're not too young, you're not too old. Jesus is calling you. And so let's keep going. It says here, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it's written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. And a pair of turtle doves, um, or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Now this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took Jesus in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servants depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people in Israel. I just want to stop there. We're not going to hang on this too long, but something that's interesting to note here is that we know that Jesus was called to the Israelites. He was called to the Jewish people. That's like where his ministry was focused. But even before Jesus could talk, they were saying that it's for more than that. Jesus is going to be focused on the Jewish people. But Jesus isn't just for Jewish people. 
He's not just for the Hebrew nation. It says that he is a, a he is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Jesus is for all of us. He's for the Israel people. He's for the Gentiles. He's for the Indian. He's for all of us. Jesus is for us all. And that's what it was supposed to be the entire time. When Paul got saved, his ministry was to the Gentile people. God cares about those who, who the, the world and culture at the time say that they're not good, <laughs> right? Jewish people or the Israelite people didn't like Gentiles. They didn't want them in the kingdom. But Jesus had other plans, and we're going to read more about that as we keep going through Luke. So let's keep going. It says, And his father and mother marveled again at what was said about him. Can you imagine having this uh, baby? And like before the baby even turns like eight weeks old, like 30 prophecies are fulfilled, and random people are coming up and like, hey, by the way, we're out chilling with our sheep, and like a whole host of heaven came down and glorified this child. Just thought you should know. And then they take him to like go get circumcised and stuff. And this random dude is like, oh, hey, so you know, God told me I wouldn't die until I saw this baby. Can you imagine how Simeon felt after he left the place, knowing that like he could die at any moment now? <laughs> <laughs> but he was probably content, right? And so, the, yeah, his father and mother, Joseph and Mary, they marveled at everything that was said to them. Because these were intense moments, an insane nine months and eight days. And so Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own souls also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And then there is a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and praying night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And so when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now this next part is the second part that I really want to stay with, because this is something that I feel we don't really read much about. So this is what it says. It says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year, at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, do I have anyone in here who's 12 right now? No 12-year-olds? Well, when he was 12, they went up according to custom, and when the feast was ended, they, um, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. So they went to this Passover feast, they were having this great time, it was over now, and it was time for them to leave. So Mary and Joseph, they packed up, and this big convoy went back to where they're from. And Jesus just didn't go. Jesus didn't go. He stayed behind. But his parents didn't know it. And uh, they were supposing him to just be in the group. And they went a whole day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and they didn't find him. So they returned to Jerusalem uh, to search for him. Can you imagine that, uh, you know, it's time to leave. Your whole people go off with you. And it's been like a day or so, and you're like, man, I haven't seen Jesus for a while. Uh, have you seen him, Joseph? And Joseph's like, oh, I thought you had him. And Mary's like, typical. And so... They, they go off to their other fans, friends and family. They're like, hey, have you seen Jesus? And they're like, no. Maybe like check with the kids. And the kids are playing tag. And they're like, hey, have you seen Jesus anywhere? And they're like, no, we haven't seen Jesus. And they keep playing tag. So Mary and Joseph are like, oh, man, we better, we better go find Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is lost. And so they went back 
to Jerusalem, and they didn't find him for three days. But after three days, they found him just chilling in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who were um, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, "Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. I can imagine. I can imagine." I can imagine how that would feel. And I am sure that I will experience something similar with our baby someday. She's going to be 12 years old, playing with her friends, and I'm going to be like, where is our baby? You know, and Coco's going to be like, or I'll be like, babe, you have the baby? She's like, no, I thought you had her. And I'll be like, oh, no. I'll probably call Karina first. Did you steal her child? <laughs> but, <laughs> and I'm sure that's where she'll be. But anyway, and that, there must have been fear and worry for their child to be missing. But they found him in the temple. And he wasn't just running around playing tag with his friends. He was sitting there learning from those who have the authority to teach. He wanted to know. And so after his, her, his parents said, hey, why did you do this? He said, he said, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? He wasn't saying, why did you come back for me? He was saying, why is this like the last place that you guys have looked? I have to be in my father's house. Jesus, even as a boy, desired to know who his father was. And he wasn't just zapped with knowledge. Like, he didn't wake up at 11 years old and just, oh my gosh, I'm the Messiah. I know the entire Bible now. It wasn't like the Matrix, where they plugged in the back of his head, and Neo, I forget that guy's name, but in the movie, he's Neo, and he just wakes up and goes, I know Kung Fu, and then they go fighting for a couple hours. No, Jesus went to the temple, and he went to go learn about his father. He wanted to know what the scriptures said. He wanted to understand the authority of the scriptures. And he didn't just go there and blab off everything he knew. It says that he went there and he was listening and he was asking questions. And then at the very end, it said Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I... I am the biggest dude for excuses. I can come up with excuses. I can make up an excuse. If I don't want to do something, I can come up with a pretty decent reason why I don't want to do it. And the reason why that gets me in trouble is, one, there's an integrity issue there that, um, you know, you, you can't just come up with excuses when you don't want to do something, right? But the other reason is, when I get busy, when I get overwhelmed, when I get built up with the pressures of life, oftentimes it's my time with God that gets neglected. I'll focus on everything else. Right now, I'm building and I'm making a nursery. Yesterday, we moved in a refrigerator and a dresser, and we, I mean, we did so much work yesterday. And it's easy to get caught up in our jobs, to get caught up in culture, to get caught up in the things that uh, our political that we care about and this and that, we can get caught up in so many things and we can still neglect the one thing that is eternally important. And Jesus, he was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. He had just as much ability to get distracted as we did. He had just as much desire to want to go off and, and do his own thing. But Jesus knew that he had to be where his father was. And when I read this, I get inspired by a 12-year-old to know God and put him first in my life. My age isn't, a, isn't an excuse. Nothing is an excuse. I want to know my father. And this story right here is interesting because we don't ever think about Jesus he didn't run away, but he didn't come with his parents. You know, he went to the temple. But we don't read about this very much. We don't think about it. But Jesus was so committed to the Father that he couldn't help but be with his Father. 
Now, when it comes to knowing and growing in the Lord, I just want to share a couple of practical points with you guys. I think one of the reasons a lot of us uh, stray away or back off from reading our Bibles, I mean, that's not like, you know, when we talk about how do you grow in the Lord, it's always like, read your Bibles, you know. Guys, there's a lot that goes into this. There's coming to church, there's reading your Bibles, there's praying, there's thinking about God, there's talking about God. There's all, I mean, there's all sorts of ways, so I don't want to sit here and hammer, hey, you must be reading one chapter a day, every day. Guys, take this up with God, okay? Take this up with the Lord. Think or pray and ask God, what do you, or what is he asking you to do to continue growing in him, right? But reading your Bible is an important part of this. But let's be real. The Bible can be confusing. There can be a lot of parts about it that you don't understand. You can read, if you're like me, you can read like a whole, I mean, I can read for a long time. And not remember a single thing that I read. I don't know how. Is anybody else like that? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll be reading novels. And I, like, I'm thinking about everything but the novel. And I do that while reading my, my Bible, too. I'm not saying I'm proud of it. I'm just saying that it happens. Um, I need to see Lisa after church and get some medication. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it's easy to get distracted. But... There's three things that I have learned to help me be more engaged, and not just more engaged, but continue to grow in the Lord. And I've been applying these to my life for probably the last, intentionally the last year, unintentionally probably the last 20 years. And this is, it says here exactly what Jesus was doing. Verse 46, after three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them. And asking them questions. Guys, asking questions is such a valuable part of growing in the Lord. And I want you to be aware right now that God is not afraid of your questions. Jesus asked questions. There were things that the teachers taught about that Jesus may not have understood that he asked questions about it. The most important part is when you ask questions, be prepared for the answer. A lot of the times we're afraid to ask questions because we understand that these answers might actually lead us out of sin in our own life, and that makes us uncomfortable. Because sin is kind of comfortable, it's kind of easy, it's kind of fun. But when God calls us to a higher standard, because we ask the question, he's not only calling us out of something that we're doing, but he, we're actually like the reason why he, like we started that, you know? So when you ask a question, be prepared for the answer. But also on top of that, sometimes asking questions is hard. You don't even know what to ask. You read a thing and you're like, I understand so little of this that I don't even know what I could ask right now. And so what I'm going to share with you guys right now are the three questions that I ask while reading the Bible, while studying things, while looking at things. And the first one is the question, what? Guys, what is, that's the first question we ask in life. When our mom is doing laundry and we're two years old, three years old, we say, mom, what are you doing? And she says, I'm doing the laundry, you know, or I'm cooking you dinner, or I'm changing your diaper. You're three years old. You should stop doing this, <laughs> but I am changing your diaper. You know, we ask the question, what? And what is a fantastic question to ask? Because it gets the ball rolling. When we ask the question, what's in the Bible? It helps us have an understanding of what we're looking for. Jesus is dying on the cross. That's what he's doing. Jesus is walking on water. Jesus is healing the lame. We can see, okay, that is what he's doing. When I moved to Alaska for the first time, guys, did anyone know me when I first moved to Alaska? Like, I came to the school. Dad, yeah, you knew me. Anna knew me. Anthony, I met you, yeah. Um, There's a lot of people that I saw at the school. And guys, I swear, I didn't even know how to tie my shoes. I knew nothing. I was 18. I didn't know how to tie my shoes. But really, like, I feel like I knew nothing about what it took to live here. 
And the longer I'm here, the less I feel like I know, actually. But then I started hanging out with Lance, and we got ready for fishing season, and we're in the boat, and Lance is grabbing grease, and he's grabbing oil, and he's doing stuff to the motor, and he's tying knots, and I was blown away. I've never actually seen somebody work on a boat, like, hard, you know? And the only thing that I could ask to figure out what I'm comprehending is, Lance, what are you doing? And he says, I'm changing the oil on the lower unit. I'm greasing the steering mechanism. I'm tying the knots to the anchor. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But if I didn't ask that question, I would just be sitting there wondering, like, what's going on? And I guess, I bet you guys can understand, or can guess what the second question to follow is. After I ask my mom, mom, what are you doing? And she says, I'm doing the laundry. I'm automatically going to respond as a three-year-old. Why? Why are you doing the laundry right now, Mom? Well, because I need your clothes clean. Why? Well, because you smell like poop. Why? Because you pooped. Like, these are the things that a three-year-old will ask you the question, why, forever. I think I read uh, a statistic that like these toddlers ask like 450 questions a day, and a majority of them is the question why, 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 and so we ask the question, God, what are you doing? I'm dying on the cross. Well, why? And that's where the growing really begins, guys. When you read the Bible and you see the question what, then we ask the question why. And could you imagine Jesus asking the question why, why he's sitting in the temple and he says, hey, what's this mean? And they say, it means this. And he says, well, why is it that way? And Jesus begins to be connecting the dots and he begins to be learning and growing in wisdom. And then he begins to start to understand that things start to click. And so when I ask Lance working on the boat, why are you changing or why are you changing the oil on the lower unit? Well, because oil keeps it lubricated. And if our boat isn't functioning right, the engine is going to blow and we're going to be stranded at sea. Why are you greasing the steering mechanism? Because if it's not greased, you won't be able to turn well. You can run into a sandbar. It's just going to be hard to work with. And so when we ask this question, why, man, God starts to really turn the wheels. He starts to reveal his truth and his honesty to us. But there's one more question that I feel takes us um, even a step further. And this is something that comes a little bit older as you get a little bit more mature. I mean, you can do it now for sure. But I think this question doesn't naturally come to us until later on in life. Think about it. When you're a child, you ask your mom, what are you doing? I'm doing the laundry. And then you ask why, and she says, well, because you need clean clothes. And then you grow up, and you go to college, and your clothes are dirty, and you call your mom up, and you say, Mom, how do I do laundry? <laughs> right? And she says, have I really not taught you, <laughs> like, this whole time? And so your mom comes over, and she shows you how to do your laundry. Well, you're, if you're going to do it, you're going to need fabric softener, you're going to need laundry detergent, this is what super size means, you know, these are all these things, and then you have to dry it, you need dryer sheets. They come and they show you the how, how of life. When it came to me and Lance working on the boats, right? I asked, Lance, what are you doing? Changing the oil, why are you doing it? So we don't die. And now this summer is the first time I started asking Lance the question, how? I'm getting older, I'm about to have a baby, I, I, I'm able to think about buying stuff, and I want a boat. But boats are a big responsibility, so if I'm going to care for a boat, I need to know how to care for a boat. I didn't care how to change the oil 10 years ago when I first met Lance, I just wanted to know what and why he was doing it. But when you start asking the question how, you go from being an inactive part, just learning, and now you're actually learning something that's going to perpetuate your motion into taking action. When Lance showed me this is how you do it, I now have a responsibility to, if I have a boat, I don't have an excuse. 
I know how to do these things. And if the motor blows up, it's because I didn't do what I was taught to do. And so when we look at the Bible and we say, God, what are you doing? I'm dying on the cross. Why are you doing it? Because there's sin in your life, and this is the way to be free of it. And then I say, God, how does that work? How did dying on the cross free me of sin? Guys, the whole entire Bible opens up to you. He takes you back to Genesis. Well, I prophesied about this 2,000 years ago or whatever. And sin came into the world. And then you get into Exodus. There was a spotless lamb. There was a Passover. And then he just opens up this entire thing until you realize the mechanisms of, wow, this is how it happened. And guys, it will change your life. And Jesus was sitting there, and he was asking probably these very same questions that we're asking, that we can ask. And it will help you grow, and God will be so pleased to answer. Matthew 6 shares with us, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. If you want to know, if you want to know, just ask. Like Fight Club when that guy needed a place to stay. Just ask, dude. You know? And so that's what I want to share with you. The life and ministry of Jesus is reaching out to those who feel they don't deserve it. He doesn't care about your social status. He doesn't care about your past sins. And the other part of his life and ministry is confronting the questions that we have. He's not afraid of them. Just be prepared for the answer. And look for the answer in the Bible. If you don't know, ask. Just don't come up with your own reasoning to life because that can really lead you astray. And guys, finally, at the very end, I just want to share with you this word will not make sense without the promised Holy Spirit in that comes through salvation. To the world, the things that we believe is dumb. The Bible says that it's folly. The world is going to look at us and have sympathy for us because we believe literally what this Bible says. But when we are in Christ, when we are saved, these things start to come together. They start to make sense. And I want to share with you guys right now, um, if you have never taken the step to be in Christ, to get saved, to be forgiven of your sins, to, to receive this Holy Spirit, I just want to share with you now that uh, come, come talk to me. Come talk to me now. Come talk to me after service. Talk. Like, let's, let's get together. Because that's something that is not just important now, but will be eternally important for eternity. No other way to put it. So I'm going to close this out with a word of prayer, and we'll stop. So Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for helping us learn about your Son. Thank you, God, that we get to look in your Bible and know you. And I ask that you continue to confront our questions, continue to confront our doubts, Continue to teach us with your Holy Spirit the truth of your word as you wrote it down and as it's meant to be taught, God, as it's meant to be known. We trust you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with our knowledge. We trust you with who you are. And I ask that we leave this place knowing you more now than we did when we came in, that we can glorify you with our lives every single day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you guys for coming. It's been a pleasure. Um, Lance is in here because he had vertigo. <laughs>